at LIGO, we use lasers and mirrors to detect gravitational waves. But the core question is, how? Well, the short answer is that we take a gravitational wave and send it on the detector and convert it to laser power that we can detect. This is done by placing seven optics in a specific pattern known as a dual recycled Fabry Perot Michelson interferometer. What will we learn in this video? My hope is that we will gain an intuition for how the LIGO detectors generate a laser signal from a gravitational wave. You may have heard that gravitational waves are exceedingly small and create length changes which are a thousand times smaller than the atomic nucleus. And you may wonder, how is it possible to detect something that is smaller than the nucleus of an atom? Today, we will derive how advanced LIGO's optical configuration amplifies this tiny astrophysical signal into something we can detect. We'll do this in three steps. First, we'll briefly explore what a gravitational wave does to the LIGO detector and everything else in the universe. Second, we'll delve into the fundamentals of optics and review what a laser beam is and how it interacts with a mirror. Third, We'll use what we learned to build a Fabry Perot interferometer and a Michelson interferometer, the core technologies of LIGO. Gravitational waves affect lengths in spacetime itself. To see how this works, we'll build our own spacetime and put a ring of test particles in it. Next, we'll construct a matrix describing how a gravitational wave affects our x and y coordinates and give them values. Now we turn on the plus polarization. The gravitational wave stretches in one direction while squeezing in the other. Now we turn off the plus polarization and change to the cross polarization, which is similar to the plus but rotated 45 degrees. Now we can add a relative phase 5 between the polarizations and turn both on at once. When we change the relative phase, we get circularly polarized gravitational waves. If we set the gravitational wave amplitudes in relative phase to arbitrary values, we get elliptically polarized gravitational waves. If we turn on the plus polarization again, and replace two of our test particles with mirrors, we will see the kind of motion that a LIGO detector might witness as a gravitational wave passes through. However, the effects shown here are vastly exaggerated. The strongest ever detected gravitational wave was about a factor of 10 to the minus 21 smaller than shown here. Gravitational waves of this magnitude only come from extremely high mass, rapidly accelerating sources. The most common source of gravitational waves are two black holes in deep space orbiting one another until they get to the end of their life and merge together into one gigantic black hole in a violent collision where both components are moving at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. So now we know that gravitational waves will produce length changes inside of our detector. We'll now move on to review what a laser beam is and how it interacts with a mirror. First, we'll create a laser beam. In our case, the laser beam is very simple. It's just a sine wave with a certain amount of phase called phi. We can evolve this phase with time. The phase of our sine wave also depends on the wavelength lambda, which we can change to make longer 
are shorter. Next, we introduce a partially reflecting mirror to our laser beam. This splits our input laser beam into a reflected beam and a transmitted beam. We can move our mirror around and watch what happens. The phase of the reflected beam is very sensitive to the mirror position, but the transmitted beam doesn't care. Next, we can change the reflectivity of the mirror. start propagating with time again. Now that we have an intuition for one beam and one mirror, we'll introduce two beams. The total electric field is the sum of both beams, where A and B are the amplitude, Omega is the angular frequency, T is time, K is the wave number related to the wavelength, and X is space. The wave number K is used to indicate the direction that the wave is traveling. Now I want to introduce a concept called the propagation matrix. We introduce an arbitrary length L and split our beams into two parts. The propagation matrix describes how each beam evolves as it travels through this distance L. We can multiply our input or A beams by our output or B beams and multiply the matrices out. We can create a dial to visualize the phase accrued by each beam as it propagates through this distance as we change the distance. So now we can relay input and output beams as they travel through space. So we'll reintroduce our mirror. For now, our mirror will just have zero reflectivity. Similarly to the propagation matrix, we can draw up a reflectivity matrix which relates our input and output beams. The reflectivity in the matrix is described by R, and the transmission is described by tau. When we multiply out this matrix, we can see how the output beams are a sum of our two input beams now. But for right now, R is equal to zero, so we'll eliminate it and propagate our beams as normal. Next, we can make our mirror entirely reflective, with no transmission. This time, there is a negative sign for one beam, but not for the other. We won't dive into this too much except to say that it's a convention chosen based on which side you're reflecting off the mirror. Finally, we make the mirror half reflective. We've made one output beam disappear entirely, while the other has been multiplied by a square root of two. Now let's move the mirror. Now B1 is equal to zero, and B2 is multiplied by a square root of two. And by moving further, we can recover the original situation. This summing of waves is known as interference. Interference is so fundamental to what we do, it's literally the I in LIGO. The concept of interference is simple. It's merely the summing of sine waves but we've seen that it can give unintuitive results, causing one beam to disappear entirely by shining in a second beam. So now we understand that a laser beam is just a simple sine wave, and it can sum together with other sine waves in a process called interference. Now we'll build a Fabry-Perot interferometer. This is a Fabry-Perot cavity just two well-aligned mirrors, separated by some distance L 
Let's inject a test beam inside of our cavity and see what happens when we move the length around. Whoa, we seem to get a huge spike in power at two different lengths. Let's take a closer look. Let's rebuild the Fabry Pro cavity and label everything a little bit more carefully. We have our input mirror in front and behind the end mirror aligned at a length L apart. Next we have our input beam, our reflected beam, our intracavity beam going to the right and to the left, and finally our transmitted beam. We can also draw the total beams in front of and inside the cavity. Now let's move the cavity length once more. At the cavity length equal to 8, the cav left and cav right beams align, producing a large standing wave. This corresponds to a massive increase in intracavity power. Let's see if we can derive where this increase comes from. Again, we'll recreate the fabry pro mirrors and the laser beams, but we'll simplify the beams down to just arrows. We want to derive the cavity gain, which is the ratio of the cav east beam and the cavity input beam. Because it's inside a two mirror cavity, the cav east beam is actually made up of an infinite series of electric fields. Let's look at each term in the sum. The first term, E0, is straightforward. It comes directly from the input beam transmission through the input mirror. The second term, E1, comes from the input beam transmitting through the input mirror, reflecting off the end mirror, reflecting again off the input mirror, and accruing the cavity phase length. The third term, E2, is the same as E1, but with two full round trips made through the cavity instead of just one. The fourth term, E3, features three round trips, and so on. Let's put it all together. Now this infinite series may look familiar to some. It's the geometric series. Our mirror reflectivities must be less than one, so the geometric series holds for us. Let's rearrange. And here, we have a convenient expression for the cavity gain. Now let's return to that moment where our beams align. That moment is when the fabry perot achieves resonance. This expression depends entirely on the reflectivities of the mirrors used in the fabry perot and the length of the fabry perot If we set the values of the reflectivities of the mirrors to be close to 1, then this denominator can potentially be very small if we set the phasor to 1. If we go through some math, we can find when the phasor becomes close to 1. And we arrive at this expression, which is called the resonance condition. Now that we have our cavity gain expression, let's return to our fabry perot and derive the expression for the reflected beam off of a fabry perot There are two main components to the reflected beam. The beam promptly reflected off the input mirror, and the beam coming from inside the cavity. Now we just move this expression up and do some algebra. And now we have our expression for our input beam to our reflected beam called the complex cavity reflection, r -cav. Now let's write down our mirror reflectivities and draw our length phasor and our complex cavity reflectivity. <laughs>
and move the length around again. We note that the reflected beam becomes exactly zero when we're on resonance, but when we're off resonance, it has some value. Now let's change the cavity to have highly reflecting mirrors and see how it changes the overall cavity gain. First, we make the end mirror perfectly reflective. Note that our cav is now equal to one. We change the input mirror to be 90% reflective. Now we lower the input amplitude and make it 99% reflective. Now that is a highly performing cavity. If we move off resonance again, the beams quickly go to zero. Now let's very slowly bring it back to resonance. Now I want to call attention to the extreme sensitivity to length that the cavity reflection has. The best way to do that is to take the derivative of the cavity length with respect to length. To further simplify this expression, we'll assume that the cavity is on resonance and that energy is conserved in the electric field. And this expression is the fabry perot response to changes in length. I want to call your attention to the denominator here. We know that the denominator is already small, and here it's getting squared. This will make our reflected beam super sensitive to changes in length. Let's quickly review everything we just learned about fabry perot interferometers. They are just two mirror cavities that are separated by some distance L. When the length of the cavity is equal to the half integer wavelength of the laser beam, the beams inside the cavity will resonate. For fabry perots with highly reflective mirrors, the number of internal reflections will increase, increasing the resonant power inside. Fabry perots with high power inside are also highly sensitive to length changes. Finally, Gravitational waves will naturally change the length L of a fabry perot interferometer. Now we have some conception of a fabry perot interferometer, and we'll move on to understanding a Michelson interferometer. This is a Michelson interferometer. It's characterized by its central 50-50 beam splitter which splits the beam into two arms, the X-arm and the Y-arm. The beams from the arms are reflected off highly reflecting end mirrors in each arm, where they go back to the beam splitter and are combined into the reflected and transmitted beams. This interferometer is set up such that the length of each arm is equivalent. Notice that no power is reaching the photodetector. We can change that by changing the length of the arms. Now all of the input power is reaching the output photodetector, and none is being reflected. We can shift the X arm length again to return all the power to the reflected beam, and none to the transmitted beam. Now I want to start deriving some equations, so we recall our reflection matrix and label each side of the beam splitter with a positive or negative reflectivity. The input beam in the X-arm is transmitted. The input beam in the Y-arm is reflected. The reflected beam is made up of the sum from the X-arm transmitted back through the beam splitter, plus the reflection from the Y-arm. Similarly, the transmitted beam is made up of the reflection off the back of the beam splitter for the X-arm plus the transmission through from the Y-arm. Now that we have these equations, let's do some algebra, starting with the reflection. First, we use our equations for the X and Y-arm. Next, we'll assume our beam splitter is actually 50-50. Now we'll do a change of basis from the X-arm, Y-arm basis to the common LC and differential 
LD basis. Subbing those in, taking out a common factor of LC, and using a trig identity. Rearranging gives us what we call the Michelson reflectivity. Now let's store these equations for later and do the same for the transmission. This gives us what we call the Michelson transmittivity. Now let's rebuild our Michelson and test our derivation. Again, let's set the lengths of each arm to be equivalent and apply common motion to each arm. Notice that we see an overall phase change inside the interferometer with common motion, but no power ever exits the transmission port. Now we'll switch to differential motion. Now I do see the power levels in each port changing. Let's briefly review everything we learned about the Michelson interferometer. First, we learned that only differential motion changes the amount of laser power in each beam splitter port. Common motion between the arms creates an overall phase shift but does not change the power levels. This makes the Michelson very good at detecting differential motion between our arms at the transmission port. And gravitational waves will naturally create differential motion. This is a fabry perot Michelson interferometer. Here the Michelson has both of its highly reflecting end mirrors replaced with fabry perot cavities. Our job now is to derive the power on the photodetector when a gravitational wave hits. To do this, we recall the Michelson transmissivity equation and the fabry perot length response. We'll start with the Michelson transmission. We will replace the differential length LD with the differential phase coming from each of the fabry perot cavities that are now in the arms, and set the overall common length phase to 1. And if we further assume that phi D will be small, then we can further simplify this equation. But now, what is the phase change of the arms phi x and phi y? Well, we have a very tempting looking equation sitting right here, but no, let's justify it. First, we note that the fabry perot when on resonance is about equal to 1. We also note that the fabry perot length response is entirely imaginary. If we look at the Taylor expansion of the cavity reflection around resonance, we'll see that any tiny differential arm offset, delta L much, much less than 1, will have changed the imaginary component of R cav, which is essentially the same as making a phase change. So we can use the Fabry Perot length response to describe the phase change in our arms and the overall differential phase. Now we have the expression for the electric field in the transmitted port, but we have one last trick of our sleeves. We can only measure power. The power in an electric field is just the electric field squared. And with some additional algebra, we can get the transmitted power on the photodetector when a gravitational wave hits. So now, finally, 
This is the sensitivity of LIGO to gravitational waves, or at least to length changes. Notice that it relies on our favorite big number, dr cav dl squared. We also have our expression for the total power in transmission, and we reviewed the fabry pro length response. Now we'll put some numbers in and see if we can detect a gravitational wave signal. And we know that our gravitational wave is very small, 1 times 10 to the minus 21. We'll factor in the 4 kilometer long arms, the small DARM offset of 1 picometer, the highly reflective mirrors, about 1 kilowatt input power, and the wavelength of the laser we use. In the end, this leaves us with orders and orders of magnitude of gravitational wave differential motion amplification, which in the end renders our gravitational waves detectable. If you made it this far, thank you for your attention and congratulations. That was a lot of optics in a short amount of time. My hope is by watching this video, you developed some small intuition for how gravitational wave detections really happen. Whether it's Fabry Perot's building up huge amounts of intracavity power through multiple reflections, or a Michelson's ability to pick out differential motion. If you have any questions, spotted any mistakes, or want to see more videos like this, let me know in the comments.